Let's see, there were uh, quite a few questions on, uh, on your uh, presentations and uh, projects. Uh, so uh, uh, let's see, I did uh, kind of give out some instructions on, on uh, what to include uh, and, and such. And tomorrow uh, I'll send out uh, an email about where. Uh, either if it's not in this room, it will be somewhere in this building, maybe on the fourth floor. Okay. And uh, as I uh, mentioned, the first uh, uh, presentation and report is primarily uh, to ensure that you get started on it and uh, on, on, on the projects that you have chosen. And uh, uh, I mean, it is kind of my intention to, um, um, uh, one of the intentions for the projects were, uh, was to uh, uh, go beyond what we are covering in this course rather than be limited to it. So, so and not just that, we, uh, it would be really nice if you identify uh, something that is uh, uh, at least at this stage unsolved uh, and and uh, uh, can make some progress towards thinking about it and uh, how what, how might one uh, address the problem uh, typically the biggest challenge is, is identifying the problem and identifying what is the uh, problem you know, and and then uh, uh, that is the biggest challenge and if we reach that point that would be kind of nice so, okay, tomorrow afternoon, these are five minute presentations, five slides, and I gave out some instructions. Uh, okay, so uh, let's see. Uh, 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 I think uh, uh, we are at a stage, uh, basically the last few uh, uh, classes, maybe six or seven, I can't, can't remember, but uh, something like that. So uh, today we are gonna uh, start on a topic which uh, uh, is is uh, uh, many of you have seen it many times probably, but uh, I think in it lies the heart of every uh, you know aspect of uh, these geometrical and topological aspects that people have been looking at in condensed matter systems, uh, uh, and uh, it uh, kind of the philosophy of, of uh, how it comes about in a certain sense uh, goes back to uh, the idea of spin itself and spin uh, of electrons or of uh, quantum particles. Uh, I think you might have seen in various levels of introduction, but we're going to uh, cover it in, in, a, in a way that is well suited to understand the topics uh, such as, uh, you know, Berry phases, churn numbers, topological insulators, and such things. Okay. So, so they are very deeply tied together. You know, so so, uh, so uh, uh, let's start with uh, uh, understanding of electron spin. And I think uh, a spin, uh, these are again uh, some temporary slides I put together. Uh, uh, we have uh, kind of uh, uh, let this course be uh, you know, directed by experimental, uh, uh, experimental evidence. And uh, some of the earliest evidence of electron spin, or spin in general, were in experiments uh, uh, such as the stern gerlach uh, experiment. And what is this experiment? Uh, uh, maybe somebody can tell me what is the stern gerlach experiment. Do you remember? I'm pretty sure you have seen it or heard about it in your introductory courses, or you have actually uh, seen it in some advanced courses as well. So what is the stern gerlach experiment? It has to do with transport of particles. So, uh, so what is the experiment? Maybe somebody can help me with it. So you shoot the thing of the electron and mm -hmm. to a uh, magnetic field. Yes. So we'll see, uh, there are two stripes. Very good point. That's right. That's exactly right. So uh, uh, what he said is, is uh, uh, the experiment is the following. So you, you take a, a bunch of uh, particles uh, and you essentially shoot them uh, through uh, a region which has a non-uniform magnetic field. So, so typically, I don't know how would you generate that. Maybe uh, you have a uh, you know, magnetic poles, you know, so, so non-uniform uh, uh, plates that uh, so apply basically some spatially variable magnetic field. Okay. And, and then you kind of shoot these through here and you collect them on a screen on, on the other side. Okay. Collect them on a screen on the other side. And it's a magnetic field. And uh, uh, let's see. So what, what, is, uh, what are the things one expects in such a transport process? So here you see already transport of these particles occurring through a region which has a magnetic field. So uh, let's imagine uh, classically what would happen. Right? So, so let's say these particles that you shoot through are small, tiny magnets. Okay? So, so let's say they're tiny magnets. So, so they're kind of randomly oriented. They're tiny magnets. 
you shoot, shoot it through there. Let's look at one magnet. As you shoot it through, what will the magnetic field do to it? Right? What does a magnetic field do to a magnetic, uh, to a magnet? So for example, let's say this is North Pole, that's South Pole. Right? Let's say. So as it goes through, it will kind of align. Right? It will get aligned by it. And then when it goes here, it will maybe land like that, because that will be the, meaning uh, as it goes through, it's, it is, uh, uh, the magnet is aligned by this magnetic field and it goes like that. Right? Similarly, if you have another one, uh, uh, which is uh, you know, kind of downspin, uh, rather the, the magnetic field is, these are classical magnets, there's no spin at all, no quantum mechanics. And then there's another one, it will kind of maybe align here, and then you, since you have a bunch of particles with various alignments of these magnets, and you shot them through, you expect to see, you know, you know, essentially something like that. You have all, all these magnets that stuck on this, that have made it through this region and have been aligned in different ways. You can see a whole, a whole range. And if you do it with a, experimentally, you know, if you actually take a number of these uh, classical magnets and you do it, this is what you'll see. This is really, I mean, this is exactly what you'll see. Uh, but uh, what uh, Stern and Gerlach were doing was instead of taking these magnets, they took, uh, at, this, at that time, it was a bunch of silver uh, uh, atoms, atoms, pu pu highly purified silver atoms. And uh, uh, silver atoms have this property that uh, they are, well, an atom is electrically neutral. So electrically neutral particles, if you shoot through a magnet, uh, so, so essentially what you expect then is kind of, uh, uh, if you have classical things, you expect a whole range of things. And it's electrical, electrically neutral uh, particle if you shoot through. Uh, so, so first of all, uh, can you suggest why do we need a non-uniform magnetic field? That's something nice to discuss. Why do we need a non-uniform magnetic field? So what will happen if I had a uniform magnetic field? So, for example, uh, you know, if you have a dipole, magnetic dipole, or an electrical dipole, right? if you place it in a uniform electric field, electrical dipole, it will just turn and stay there. It will not move. That makes sense. So, so let's my electric field is pointing in this way, and I put an electrical dipole there. Then uh, basically the field will align such so that the positive and negative you know, dipole cancel like that, and it will kind of get stuck like this. It will not move anywhere. But if you have a non-uniform field, then the field here is larger than the field there. Okay? Therefore, the force on the negative is different from the force on the positive. Right? So there's a slight mismatch, and therefore the thing moves. There's a drift motion, transport effect. Right? So in a very similar way, if you have a magnet, you can imagine it will, you know, it to, in order to be able to move, it needs a non-uniform or a gradient in the field. Uh, so this is, a, uh, this is true about any dipoles, electric dipole or magnetic dipole. An electric, di electric dipole needs a gradient in electric field to move. A magnetic dipole needs a gradient in magnetic field to move. Okay, so, so uh, when, you, uh, when, when he actually did that, when Stern Gallag, uh, Stern -Gallag they took this uh, bunch of silver atoms and they shot it through, what they observe is instead of something like this, they observe basically two stripes. You know, there's a bunch of atoms that land here and a bunch of atoms that land here. And that is it. And there is nothing in between. There's no, no, no stuff in between. And uh, so that's obviously that was at, at that point, you know, 1920s, uh, early 20s, it's very mysterious uh, what's going on. Why, why? It seemed as if these neutral atoms had some internal, uh, internal uh, magnetic field built into them. Or, you know, it was like a magnet except it can have only two values, you know. It's, you know, it could have only two values. It's a kind of weird power part of it. Yeah. And then uh, what you can do is uh, you can take this beam, you let it through a hole here, and then put the same thing here, and it will deflect, and there will be no more beams as long as the magnetic field is oriented in the same direction. It will deflect, and it will not produce two, but only one now. But if you turn this again at 90 degrees, you again get two, and, and th things like that. So that's a stern gerlach experiment. And uh, um, so, so that, that uh, clearly kind of indicated that there is some sort of an internal uh, magnetism in the atoms. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, so, so uh, to, to explain this property, and, and then very soon after that, uh, this was, uh, it was replaced by sodium and all kinds of alkali metals. 
And the reason for doing this experiment, not with electrons initially, but with atoms, is because if you have electrons, you have the other issue that electrons are charged. Right? So they'll also undergo this Lorentz deformation. So there'll be a lot of bending of electrons as well. But atoms are uncharged, so they, the only thing that kind of gets modified by the magnetic field is its magnetic moment, right? not, not the charge. So, but if you take an electron, you'll have the same thing, except you have to kind of balance out the bending due to the magnetic, you know, Lorentz bending. Okay, so, uh, okay, so uh, and then you can also do it with electrons, except you have to take care of the Lorentz force here. So, uh, and then very soon after that, experiments were done that uh, probed other alkali elements and then electrons and such. And so there were, uh, uh, in fact, uh, um, you know, uh, so, so there were some theorists who, who tried to explain this property by saying that uh, the electron has an internal magnetic moment. Uh, and, uh, and actually, very interestingly, Pauli uh, kind of very strongly opposed that because he could kind of say, see that it would run into some difficulties and such, such things. But anyway, the, there were some uh, efforts to explain this uh, phenomena by saying that uh, there's an internal, you know, uh, uh, el electrons are essentially spinning around their own axis in addition to uh, being spinning around the nucleus. You know. so, so there's an angular moment. And we're going to do this in quite some detail. And then Pauli, uh, when he came along, and, and uh, he, he, what he said was, uh, well, for modeling electrons or atoms or anything, we have been always looking at wave functions. Right? Uh, by that time, 1920s, late 20s, you know, the quantum mechanics of electrons was being, of particles was being uh, formulated in itself. So here, what he said this is the wave function cannot be, in order to explain this in, intrinsic two-valued nature of, uh, of, of these particles, uh, I, I have to write it in a slightly different way. It, it has two components, one corresponding to that one and another corresponding to the other one. And I have to look at something like this. I cannot have a scalar. So, so that, that was Pauli's initial uh, uh, proposal that uh, 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 instead of a scalar number to represent the wave function or the function of the state. Uh, remember a uh, long time ago, when the beginning of the course, we were talking about why do we need a function, I mean, of things that have both particle and wave nature. Now there's another twist to it. It has not just particle and wave nature, it also has this weird property of magnet, internal magnetism, right? so it's spin. So in order to account for that, Pauli suggested that we break it into a two component function. And, uh, um, and, and, and essentially, uh, uh, what he uh, proposed is, is you write it as uh, one scalar plus another scalar times 0, 1. And then uh, uh, you can, uh, so, so he actually introduced this Pauli spin matrices and things like that. And from there, he could explain why the Hamiltonian of an electron, for example, will be the original Hamiltonian that we have talked about uh, you know, many times, plus a little new factor now, which is related to the spin. These are Pauli spin matrices. So now what we are going to do is, uh, uh, so what Pauli had to do was introduce this in a very ad hoc way, meaning there was no kind of, uh, there's obviously the experimental data, and then he was trying to make the mathematics consistent with what experimental, basically it's kind of, you know, uh, uh, building in, in into it, uh, it uh, building the spin into the uh, into the Schrodinger equation uh, in an ad hoc way, in some sense. So it's essentially introduce it and say that it will explain what you, what what this is doing. And uh, uh, and then uh, so so there are two two factors. Uh, one is due to you know the direct spin, and then there is if the electron is also moving in a crystal, it is in a crystal potential electric field of the nucleus and such things. So, so that crea creates another term, which is the spin orbit term. So this is the direct spin term, this is a spin orbit interaction term for a crystal. So these are the two new terms that appear the moment you introduce spin. And this must appear, uh, these two terms uh, are as fundamental for an electron, for example, as the charge of the electron, the mass of the electron, and the spin. These three are the most fundamental quantities of the electron. The spin is very fundamental as well, as, as fundamental as the spin, as the charge and the mass. So, so that's the thing. So what we are going to do is, is look at a spin from the way that Dirac introduced it. What he, Dirac found a little later after Pauli was, uh, uh, was, was he, he was trying to essentially uh, um, unify or, or merge uh, uh, you know, Einstein's uh, special relativity and quantum mechanics 
And uh, finally, when he was able to do that and find a new equation, uh, which you know is modified to the it's not the Schrodinger equation, but now called the Dirac equation, uh, he found that it naturally leads to something called spin. You know? So, so, so in some sense, spin is really a byproduct of, or rather, it, it is it is the it's an evidence that electrons, are just like celestial objects, you know, satisfy relativity. So do electrons. I mean, every particle uh, satisfies relativity. So uh, the reason I want to kind of do this, you know, uh, in this course is because uh, uh, a lot of these uh, new things that are emerging, as I mentioned, you know, topological insulators and uh, which have very large spin orbit coupling and such things, the ideas, many of them come from here, you know. So, so that's why we want to kind of develop this idea. So that means uh, we need to talk a little bit about special relativity. And uh, uh, generally, in courses in electrical engineering and, uh, and uh, you know, material science, these are not, not talked about. But I think we will do it in this course, because uh, primarily because uh, I think it's going to become more and more important as we go along. Uh, and uh, especially uh, with the emergence of a lot of materials that actually do satisfy you know, many of these equations, we, it's, it's nice to see, see where it comes from. And that will lead us naturally to uh, this uh, rest of the few topics in the course. Okay. So uh, let's go, go, go there and uh, let's discuss uh, that aspect of this story. All right, any, any questions here? Not, uh, so we'll go through this, this idea. So uh, we are not taking Pauli's approach of uh, you know, basically building in this spin in, a, in an ad hoc way. But rather, we're going to, uh, you know, kind of, with a you know, benefit of, in some sense, hindsight, we can really solve the whole thing in one go uh, using Dirac's ideas. Okay. So uh, now, uh, typically, uh, courses on, you know, uh, you, you might take a whole semester course on relativity and such, where we just do it in maybe, you know, 45 minutes. <laughs> and, but I'll capture the main ideas here. And hope, I, I think you will see that the ideas are really not that difficult to understand if you, you know, think about it carefully. And many of you have probably seen it uh, uh, multiple times, so bear with me, because we will merge it in, with the Dirac equation in the end. We'll see where, how it leads to spin. Yeah. OK, so uh, now uh, special relativity is, is uh, 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 again, uh, born out of uh, trying to explain experiments. And let's uh, first. Uh, look at uh, what, uh, for example, what experiment was special relativity trying to explain? Or what phenomena, which was strange, was special relativity uh, able to explain and, and you know, um, was able to essentially uh, uh, bring under the realm of, uh, uh, you know, understanding of physics in general? So wh wh what experimental fact does special relativity explain? Time dilation. So that's one aspect of it. Uh, and uh, so experimentally, uh, yeah, what, uh, f f there were some experiments which were rather weird at that time, and special relativity came along. So t time dilation is kind of one part of it. That's right, Michelson Morley experiment, which uh, uh, essentially said that the speed of light is the same no matter what frame of reference you're measuring in. Okay, so. So let's look at it from a, even going back to, uh, uh, so relativity was really not new in 1900s and when Michaels and Morley did the experiments. Relativity goes back to time, I mean, of Galileo and Newton, right? At that time already people knew that uh, uh, if two objects uh, so, uh, are moving with respect to each other, so let's, let's look at, you know, uh, the classic uh, frames of picture where I have, you know, uh, one, any observer sitting here, on one reference frame, and there's another observer for whom this is the other reference pr reference frame. So, so if 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 uh, in the reference frame of this observer, uh, an event happens at this point in x, x is zero, and then another event happens at x at at this x, And uh, 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 rather, let's look at it this way. So, so if, if uh, yeah, so the length of x here for this observer uh, would, would be very different for another observer who's moving with respect to that. That's the idea of, 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 of special relativity, or rather relativity itself. So what it's saying is uh, if I see a length of x here, if this observer measures a length x here, 
and this observer is moving, right? It's moving, uh, this observer is moving with a velocity v, whereas this is at rest. Okay? Then, uh, so, so if I had an event happen here and that event happened there, for this observer, the length is x, but what will it be for this observer? That's the question that relativity tries to answer, right? And this, rel this idea of relativity was long term, way, you know, way before. So for example, if you look at this observer when, just when it passes this origin and maybe there's a gun that you know, fired a bullet and there's a screen there, it hits the bullet. If this observer measured it, it's x is equal to you know, whatever it is. It measures, this observer measures whatever that length is. Whereas this one is moving with a velocity. So for what this observer will measure is x is, so it will measure x prime is x minus vt. You'll agree with that. The distance it measures, actually x minus vt. Uh, is that clear? I mean, so that, that, that's, that's rather you know, uh, trivial. So, uh, so the way you transform a length in this frame to that frame is x prime in this frame is equal to x in that frame minus v times t. So you can transform now velocity. Velocity transforms as dx prime over dt, right? Let's call it uh, dx prime dt, well, is dx over dt minus v, right? I mean, so, so, so for example, if something was moving here with a certain velocity, u, uh, or let's call it w, okay? Let's, something is moving here at a velocity w, then to, to this observer, it will appear at w prime, right? Something different. How, what will that look like? w prime is equal to w minus v. Right, that's, that's the way velocities will transform. Meaning, if, you know, if, if a car is moving in this sort of frame at, at a speed w, and this thing is moving uh, 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 with uh, a speed v, let's say the v is equal to w, then the car will appear stationary. That makes complete sense. So that's, where, that's how sp space transforms from one coordinate system to another, right? That's how velocities transform from one coordinate system to another. Right? And that is relativity before, uh, before Einstein and Lorentz. That this, was a, this was well understood. And, and the idea really is, comes from the fact that, and, and this is, I think, experimentally, you have probably felt it many times. You had, uh, you know, typically it says if you're sitting inside a train and if you forget about the noise and the vibrations and all that, you cannot really tell whether you're moving with a constant velocity or you're at rest. You cannot tell. There's no way, no experiment you could do that will tell you whether you're moving or you're at complete rest. That's the key idea. And, and this, this I, I think we all have sensed and we felt, right? And they mathematically captured it in these two equations that the way space and uh, 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 velocities uh, transform from one coordinate system to another, it looks like this. And why is it that you cannot tell any, uh, do any experiment that will tell you is because when you take the force, force is mass times acceleration, right? You see immediately that it's the same for both. Right? The, the force is the same for both. And that's, that's why this would be called, uh, uh, these are called inertial, reference frames. Inertial reference frames means you are either at rest or moving with a constant velocity. Right? And you can see already at rest is also up to question. What do you mean by rest, right? Because, so, so they're the same, they're identical. No experiment can tell them apart. That's the idea of general relativity. And this was known way before, you know, Einstein and all these questions. So that, this equation is very interesting if you look at it carefully. It's just saying that a velocity of anything, be it an electron, be it something, is not unique, right? I mean, that's what it's saying. It depends on what frame you're looking at. Right? Velocity is not unique. So as a result, you can right away say things like, you know, kinetic energy is half mv squared, all this stuff. They are not unique either. Right? You can say it right away from here, right? And those things came later when people were, you know, trying to understand it. So let's see. So now uh, this was known in, you know, 1600s uh, to Galileo and Newton. So this is not, this, uh, but this was the relativity. Right? And then, uh, you know, if you look forward in uh, mid-1800s now, right, and then Maxwell comes along and Faraday, and history, Maxwell solves, you know, unifies electricity and magnetism. Right? And what pops out of Maxwell's equations is, uh, is, is you know, this famous relation, uh, 
of uh, electric field or magnetic field, something like that is equal to zero. This is the Maxwell wave equation right, for light. Light, right? And you have a velocity sitting here, C. Okay? This is C, where C is the speed of light, you know, one over square root in vacuum, it is this three times ten to the power eight meters per second. Right? So so you notice immediately, and, and, and this, is, this is experimentally, I, I think you, you realize this is actually measured to great accuracy and all that, right, speed of light. Right? And so, uh, and you see right away that this C doesn't come with any of these things. You know, it, it looks like it's an absolute velocity. It's an absolute velocity. Now, uh, this is what bothered Einstein a lot, and he starts asking, so, so uh, now, uh, Galileo tells me, and Newton tells me that velocity, constant velocity depends on what velocity am I moving at, you know, my reference frame. Now, who is this velocity for? You know, who is the reference frame for this velocity? Because it seems independent of all reference frames, right? Does it make sense? So, so this, this does not depend on anything else, like how fast is this, uh, you know, uh, uh, this is the speed of light, and uh, all experiments try to kind of prove, uh, measure it, and they find it's constant, right? And so, uh, kind of related to these things, that, that's what, uh, you know, Michaels and Morley try to measure. Uh, you know, uh, but at that time, this was the understanding that if I have, uh, uh, for example, if you look at, uh, um, so, so the, maybe the Earth, let's say, and, and, and uh, you have a pillar, uh, pillar here, and the light is coming this way, okay, and the Earth is rotating that way. So on the surface of the Earth, you have a certain velocity uh, v. You have a certain velocity v, right? And uh, uh, for example, on the other side, you'd have a velocity in this way. So if I measure the speed of light, which is c, let's say, going this way, here I must measure c plus v. Here I must measure c minus v, right? It makes sense. Just from this experiment, from from this idea. Right? But when they do the measurement, they see it's actually v is equal to zero, you know, and to a great degree of precision, the velocity at which moving here is zero. They don't define it's a null result. I mean, that velocity is zero. And so now that, that was kind of weird at the time because uh, all waves are supposed to propagate through medium, right, through media. For example, sound wave. Uh, if you take away sound, uh, the air in the room, if you create a vacuum, sound cannot propagate. Right? Sound moves faster through a medium where you have more density. Because sound speed is of the order of like square root of you know, uh, some coefficients of density. I mean, basically, more is the density, uh, more is the velocity of sound, right? And then less. So, so, so uh, but this is kind of a very large velocity. So if you think of the, the, this is the speed of a wave through a medium, that medium must be extremely dense, right? It must be extremely dense. Uh, and and uh, but then also in celestial mechanics and all, we we know that the Earth and many planets have been going around the, their suns for ages, and if it's a really dense medium, they, they should slow down. They should you know basically feel the friction, but they don't seem to. Right? And we know that this thing can travel great distances because we can see distant stars. Right? So, so light, we can see that. So so clearly there's something weird going on here. And, and uh, uh, these are the things that was kind of synthesized very nicely uh, uh, by Einstein uh, to explain you know, these, all these uh, contradictions between Galilean relativity and, and what was going on with speed of light. So, uh, uh, and, then, and then you can think, I mean, there's this measurement, and then the Earth is going around the sun, right? And, and uh, uh, so, so when, when you're going this way, this is just the rotational speed, then you have the translational speed of the Earth in some sense. So that velocity should add, if you measure half a year later, it should be plus and minus, but they also got it to be zero and all that. Whenever they try to measure with respect to speed of light, what is the velocity with which your, your object is moving, they always find it to be zero. That's, that's what was the experiment, Michaels and Morley and you know, a couple of few other experiments which Einstein uh, took upon himself in order, you know, to explain. So, uh, so any questions here? Okay, if not, uh, so uh, so basically Einstein said I I I can uh, explain 
uh, why light is behaving in this very strange way? You know, why is it always leading to the fact that you are not moving with respect to light? What he said is uh, uh, light is uh, doing this because if it didn't, uh, uh, so, well, let's see, so, so his po he had two postulates, and we'll come to the postulates later, because that immediately gives you all the results. Uh, uh, so, <clears throat> what Einstein's thought process is very simple. It said that, uh, he says that, look, classical mechanics is based on this idea that, uh, 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 you know, you, you, uh, the, 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 y there's no experiment you can do in an inertial reference frame that will tell you how fast you're moving. No experiment that you can do. That's the idea of mechanics. But electromagnetism seems to say that, no, 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 you can actually do an experiment. No, because what Einstein says is, well, if this is what electromagnetism tells me, that the speed of light is going to behave as C plus V and C minus V. Inside my train, I can measure the speed of light. Right? And then I can find out at what velocity, constant velocity I'm moving at. Does that make sense? And he says that that can't be true. It, he says that classical mechanics and electromagnetism cannot follow different laws. They must follow the same laws. Okay. And uh, do you see that? Because if, if indeed you are adding velocities like this, then your classical mechanics tells you this, electromagnetism tells you this, and you can just do a measurement of speed of light, you'll get C plus V or C minus V, then you deduce from there what is your V. Okay. But he says that no, you can't do that. Right. There's no way you can measure uh, inertial reference velocity, and that is why uh, uh, what we are going to, that, that, that's the reason why he made two postulates. His postulates are very simple. He says that the laws of physics that you might measure, like Newton's laws or whatever, are the same for all frames of reference that are inertial, meaning they are at rest or moving at a constant velocity. So if I do a measurement here, experiment in this laboratory, you know, which is moving with a constant velocity, no matter how fast, like C by 2, that's fine. I do an experiment and I discover Newton's law, I discover electromagnetic theory, all that stuff, right? And somebody else is, move, is not moving with respect to me, I mean, well, I'm moving at C by two, this person is completely at rest. And in that laboratory, that person is doing these experiments of Newton's law and, and uh, Maxwell's equations. And that person discovers uh, laws of Newton and they'll be, what Einstein says is, if they're moving, if this frame is moving with a constant velocity with respect to that, the laws we'll discover are exactly the same. They can't be different. And in order to kind of uh, uh, do that, in order to get that, uh, you know, equivalence of these laws, what he, the second postulate that he had to make is that the velocity of light is a constant, no matter what reference frame you measure it in, no matter what's the source, what's the observer, or what reference frame. The speed of light is always constant. That's the second postulate. And it's a very strange postulate, right? You can see it goes right smack at this. It says this is wrong. Galilean relativity is wrong. Right? And uh, not only that is wrong, all, all of these are wrong. Not wrong, let's put it this way. They are approximations of something bigger, and that's what you find now. That's it. So the second postulate is the key postulate here, that speed of light is constant in all reference frames, all inertial reference frames. Is that clear? I mean, that, that's what we're going to basically now what we have to do is we have to rediscover all these things and find what they are now, given the fact that the speed of light is constant. Right? And, and, and that's what Einstein does now. Uh, and uh, here's the experiment that you start with. So uh, uh, for example, uh, this reference frame, let's say, is at rest. And this is moving with a velocity v. OK, yeah, this velocity, it's moving with a velocity v. And here's a thought experiment that will give you uh, the transformation laws now for what this observer will measure and what that observer will measure. But now, you have to uh, stick to this postulate. You, you have to satisfy the postulate that the speed of light that will be measured by this observer is exactly the same as the speed of light that's measured by that observer. It's not like if th this will measure C and this will measure C minus V. No, they have to measure the same C. And that's, that's, a, you know, uh, that, that's the idea. So what uh, Einstein says, well, here's the experiment. This, th this frame, this observer is going by at a velocity v. And uh, this observer does an experiment. Yeah, you know, takes a laser or a light source and shoots a photon here right? at time t is equal to 0. Right? And that photon goes along. And here's the detector here. 
and it gets absorbed or hits that detector, and that happens at x, right? And at a time t, therefore x is what times t? You know, this is a photon, so it's light. It's just c times t. So you see this is the difference. The time t is the difference between two events. One event is the laser shoots out a photon, and the second event, it gets absorbed. These are two events. Right? It's the difference in time between the two events is t. The difference in space between the two events is x. That's how they're related, two events. Now, what does this observer see? Now, that's kind of the interesting question now. Right? So now that you will have to ask the question, what is the transformation? What, how does x transform into that coordinate frame, given that the speed of light is constant? That's the tricky part here. So for that situation, what you can do is, is you can kind of uh, essentially say that uh, uh, the, you can align the time at which this laser shot the photon at, at, at the moment when the origins cross. I mean, that's fine. You, you, you are completely at freedom to choose the origins where they are and all that. At that moment. But this thing is moving at a velocity v, right? So what S prime will see is that the length that particle of photon or, uh, traveled in that coordinate frame is, is something different. You can see it's x prime. Right? We know that much at least. You'll see something different. Right? So x prime will be equal to the time that is measured by this reference frame. And this is a major departure from earlier mechanics, uh, uh, you know, Galilean invariance. That even time, and this actually not just only, this is a big departure, that time as measured by this observer, is not necessarily the same as time measured by this observer. So let's allow for that fact and say that the time that this observer measures is t prime. But how are x prime and t prime related according to Einstein's postulates? C. Because speed of light is always constant, no matter who measures it. Right? Both are. Right? So, so x prime will be c times t. Right? So now that's interesting, because now you see what, 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 it, what, it's, what it's saying is, uh, okay, so that's it. Uh, uh, now, in, in, in this observer's frame, uh, you know, that's x is c times t, x prime is c times t prime. And uh, uh, you ask the question now, how is x prime related to x? Right? That's, that's what we are after. How does it transform? What will, you know, if one measures, then the other will say. So classically, or Galilean uh, times will tell you, it's x minus v times t, where v is the velocity of second reference frame. Right. Right. And Einstein says, uh, clearly this is going to fail us because Michael, it cannot explain Michaels and Morley experiment. Right. It cannot explain why is it that in normal, all reference frames, I'm always measuring the same velocity. Right. It cannot explain it. Therefore, what I'm going to do is assume that somehow there is a factor that you have missed when you reported, when you measured the length and you know, so so there's a certain factor uh, that that by which uh, this uh, length, effective length that you have reported to me, gets changed in in this process. Some gamma we don't know yet, and vice versa. So if I if this observer measures this and it reports it to other person, uh, you know, in, in a reference from S, uh, this will actually look like. And the reference, the factor will be the same. Very interesting. So this, this must be the case. There's a missing gamma that should fix all my problems of, you know, this, this thing here. Doesn't make sense. I'm kind of going through it a little fast, but I think you can think about it. And then it says, so clearly, time and space are getting stretched out or dilated in order to satisfy the important postulate that speed of light has always got to be constant. Somehow these things are getting stretched out or dilated, or some, some, something is going on with that, this, with space and time, which is why. Right. Anyway, that's his. That, that's the thing. And then uh, uh, the question is now: Let's find out gamma because once we do that, you have solved the problem pretty much completely. Is that clear? Yeah. And to solve for that, you what you can do is just multiply the two. You get x x prime. You get gamma squared. Then you get x x prime. You know, minus vt plus vt uh, minus x vt minus x prime vt. 
Uh, sorry, I think you know it. So there should be T prime. And in this reference frame, it's all primes. Okay? So, so the times are not the same. Okay. So I get x prime x, x vt prime, x prime vt. OK. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So you multiply the two, and then you kind of just use these two relations. X is CT, X prime is also CT. This is the fundamental postulate that speed of light is always constant. Right? Just substitute it there. In fact, you can just divide one and you get, you know, uh, so what you get is X, and you get here X prime, and you get, you know, X, X prime, which is C over T, and C over T prime. Um, sorry, CT and CT prime. Right? And uh, so x is ct, and x prime is ct prime, and all that. Okay. So okay. So you see these two cancel out, right? And uh, and then your times cancel out here, and you get uh, gamma squared is equal to one over one minus v squared over c squared, right? From here. And therefore, gamma is just 1 over that square root. So that's your factor. Once you build that factor in, when you're reporting x prime, you're transforming x to, when you transform x to x prime, you must have this. Without it, you will violate you know, experimental evidence, which is the michelson moly experiment and such that. Does that make sense? Okay, so, so that's your x prime. If you want to transform into x, you know, whatever you measured in the reference frame of s, x, and t must transform like that. If, 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 if s prime is moving at the velocity v. This must be the case. And uh, is it, you know, sanity check? If this frame is the same as that frame, if velocity is zero, right? Then, you know, you get the x prime is equal to x, no problem. Similarly, you can now look at time. Well, what you'll get is time uh, for the second reference frame will be a very interesting expression, y minus v squared over c squared. So the time is no, not the same for the two reference frames. Okay? So that's what you get. And uh, uh, all right. So that's that's it. I mean, that that is really. Uh, uh, the major change from uh, classical uh, mechanics, uh, and uh, this is uh, the famous uh, Lorentz transformation. This is called the Lorentz transformation, and it's named after Lorentz because actually Lorentz had already realized it by the time Einstein, you know, uh, was doing this. So, uh, and uh, this is in some sense probably the most uh, amazing result, which had not been identified for so long, primarily because people had not done experiments to prove things. Right? And you can see uh, uh, you don't need any abstract mathematics to get here. It's just you know, standard algebra. Right? A high school student, in principle, can do this. So that's the beauty of it. Right? And, uh, and what Einstein did, which is the major revolution, is what are the consequences of it? That's what Einstein did, looks at now and says, well, well OK, let's follow this through. Because uh, clearly, this is how things are changing depending on who is measuring what. right? Now, what will be the consequences of this? That's what Einstein really does. You know? and, and, uh, OK. So uh, from here, uh, right away, you see that uh, velocities don't add like this. You know? But you can take, uh, uh, I'm not going to basically uh, try to rederive this. But uh, you know, if uh, velocity is measured in reference frame 2, and velocity is w in reference frame 1, and reference frame 2 is, measure, is moving with a velocity v with respect to 1, then the velocities will transform. Basically, the measured velocity will be like that. You know, that's how velocity will go. Okay. Again, you know, put v is equal to zero, then measure the same thing. Right? And uh, if you velocity is way smaller than speed of light, right? Then you can neglect this. You will get this. Right? So what I, what I know Einstein and Lorentz uh, transform is telling you is actually classical. Uh, you know, uh, thoughts of relativity were absolutely correct for very small velocity. They were all, all, all fine. They are still fine. But uh, this is a factor that 
uh, will fix this issue of Michelson Morley experiment when you start moving at high speed. Okay, so now uh, it's a very interesting thing. Uh, this was also noted by Minkowski. Um, so let's actually look at that. He's uh, advisor of Einstein, he is the advisor of Einstein. And Minkowski says that, look, this is very weird because you see space uh, and time seem to be very strongly, you know, it's tangled up, it's mixed up now, right? So, so X and T. So what this person is measuring depends not just on the space coordinates of this frame S, but also on the time. In this. So space and time, I cannot consider to be, to be different. I mean, they are actually the part of the same mathematical object or variable. And Minkowski then says that, uh, 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 w so uh, how do we kind of crystallize, how do we say properly what, what is the difference? I mean, how do you put your finger down on what is the major difference? How did it get tangled up? What, what, what happened here? And that's when he, you know, uh, and, and this is you know, also related to Einstein, but what Minkowski discovered was very amazingly uh, from here, uh, let's, let, 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 let me explain what I mean first and, and then, so, uh, you see what we are doing here is basically a change of reference frames, right? You're going one reference frame to another. One reference frame is, for example, at rest, the other is moving with the velocity p. It's no, no different in some sense from a changing of reference frame. For example, you have x and y, and you have a point here. Right? You have x comma y, right? And then you rotate your reference frame to x prime and y prime, right? And this coordinate looks as x prime comma y prime, right? So there are two di different reference frames. And I think you can see that x, y were the coordinates in this reference frame, and x prime and y prime are the coordinates in that reference frame. Right? Though x has changed to x prime, y has changed to y prime, what stays constant? when you go from this reference frame to that reference frame? The distance, right? that's, that's right. Yeah, from the origin, the length or the norm of a vector. Right? So, so this thing remains the same. Right? No matter what reference frame you are in, it remains the same. Right? And that's just x squared plus y squared and all that, x prime squared plus y prime squared here. And you can do it in 3D. Right? But now we are going to 4D. So that's x, y, and z and all that stuff, and there's also the time. Right? So what Minkowski asks is, well, now, yeah, I, I, I now understand this will explain the speed of light is constant, but clearly I cannot now say that a space vector is just x, y, z, because now time has gotten mixed up with this now. So he says, okay, let's produce, manufacture a new vector that represents not just space or time, but the two together. This is space-time. It's a space-time vector. It's called the four vector. And the fourth term, he puts it as time, but you see they're dimensionally inconsistent, so you multiply by speed of light, c times. So that's your four vector. Space-time four vector written as big X. Okay. So, uh, so and then Minkowski asks, says, yes, I, I want to make an analogy to this rotation of frame. I, there, my norm or the you know x square plus y square remains constant. Now, if I rotate this vector from x to x prime, where I'm measuring c t prime, right, and I'm measuring x prime, y prime, and z prime, right, I'm transforming like that. When I go from you know this reference frame to that reference frame, right. right. So if I measure some length here. Uh, uh, see, see, if you have my velocity is along the x direction, then only the x will change, the y's will not change. Does that make sense? I mean, that's, that's a contract, I mean, yeah. So I, I think I'm not getting into those details. So just the x is changing. If you go in another direction, and then you can derive many other laws of angular momentum and all that stuff, but let's just look at this. So when I change from here to here, clearly, if you just do, you know, uh, so w w w what is constant when I go from here? what remains invariant. Just like here, my length remains invariant. Now here, if you take this 
and you say that let's try with the length, you know, so I do ct squared plus x squared plus y squared plus z squared, right? If you do that for this vector, and you do that same thing for with the t prime and all that for this vector, you'll see they're different. You have the formulas here, just plug them in. Right? You'll see that that doesn't conserve. The normal, and this is called the Euclidean norm, or Euclidean norm. This is not, not the same for the two reference. So that can, can, it's not invariant. But what he found, what Minkowski found, was instead of taking a plus sign here, if you take minuses, very interesting, right? minus, then that thing is the same for both. That, that doesn't depend on which reference frame you're in now. It's conserved right? for that frame or that frame. So this is called the Minkowski norm of a four vector. Time, the ordinates of space, time squared minus length squared. So that's the Minkowski vector, Minkowski norm. And you can write it in a nice way. I'm, I, I don't want to kind of get into that. So, so this is uh, S squared is x dot x. The dot product is defined in this way. The first component square minus the sum of the next three components square, you know, x, y, and z. Okay. And you can write it in a, in a, in a, in a slightly different way. Uh, you can write it as x transpose x prime, you know, for example. And you can put in a matrix in between. Uh, this is called flat space time when you don't have gravitation. When you have gravitation, this is what Einstein, these things get changed. You know, it looks different. You know. It's a metric tensor. So, anyway, not very important. What is important is if you take minuses here, uh, this thing remains the same for both. So that must be, and this is one of the earliest examples of where physics, you know, uh, so, so you see, if something is invariant on the reference frame, that must be something physical. That's, that's the connection, it's something physical. It captures something physical, which remains invariant for two frames of reference. And that was uh, one of the, you know, among many others, one of the major contributions of Minkowski, and, and, and he relates it to, uh, finds this norm which is preserved for a reference frame. And then Einstein then takes this and, and uh, essentially he asks very simple questions. He's like, what is, uh, how do you define a velocity of a particle? If, if, if this has happened, now it has completely changed my conception of space and time and all that, right? How do you define velocity? How do you define momentum and all these things? That's what Einstein starts asking, and then he discovers all these things now. Okay? So let's uh, look at uh, velocity. So how do we define velocity? It's basically dx by dt, right? length over time. But you immediately see you're in big trouble here because time is one of the components of that vector, right? right? So, so how do you take, it's like taking dy by dx, right? I mean, you're taking the derivative of a vector with respect to one of its coordinates. It doesn't quite make sense. So how do you define velocity? Uh, so uh, so we're going to, clearly this will become a, what you call a four velocity. Everything is four now right? so, so, because time has, come into the coordinate system, so it's a four velocity. And uh, so what we're going to define it as the space, the four vector x divided by a unique time, we're going to call it tau. This is called, it's called the proper time. What is the time that is invariant, no matter what reference you're in? That's the time in the, in, in the rest frame of s. If you ask if there's an event that happened here and an event that happened there, Ask the, this observer measured some time and called it tau, okay? then that time is basically the same. You can report to, every, I mean, basically that time would be uh, identical for all reference frames, meaning the time that has lapsed between two events in the, observe, in, in the reference frame in which that event occurred. That is invariant. You know, if, if that's not clear, you can go here and see uh, that delta of t prime is equal to, this is delta of t, which is we are calling tau, the time between two events, minus v times delta x over c squared over square root of one minus v squared over c squared. But, you know, uh, for example, if, 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 the, if there's an event here, and the, they are basically the, 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 uh, the, I think you can probably see, you can create an event where this is actually exactly zero. 
in a, nothing moved in the reference frame of the observer. For example, the ob if, if, if I'm just moving with the velocity v, nothing changed here. So this is really zero. And dt prime is equal to, this is what we're calling as d proper time, d tau over 1 minus v squared over c squared. This is time measured by any other observer moving at the velocity v. This is time in the reference frame of events. This is how they're related. So the velocity then must be defined. And then, uh, again, I'm going through it. Uh, uh, hopefully, you, you see I'm going through it a little bit faster than I should, but that's, that's how it's good to be. You always have to take a derivative with respect to something that is invariant, and tau is invariant. It doesn't change for what observer you're measuring for. Uh, and uh, this is how they relate. And dt, sorry, I think we can, uh, yeah, okay. So dt by d tau would be 1 over 1 minus all that stuff. So this is just 1 over 1 minus b squared over c squared. So that's your four velocity. For velocity, if you write it out, uh, dx over d, sorry, what did I do? d tau here, right? and d tau by dt, d tau by dt. If you do this right, d tau dt. Okay, I think this is correct, just check it. So there's, a, again, that gamma factor in the denominator, and this is how it looks. Sorry, dt. Dt, yeah. Right? Uh, so now we can take this and run through this and, and ask uh, what is the four velocity? Well, the four velocity looks like uh, you know, take this, take a derivative with all that. Uh, C dx over dt times. Uh, And let's say uh, the particle is really not moving along y and z. I mean, my reference frame is moving along x. So y and z parts, no velocity. That's four velocity. And, uh, uh, and then, uh, obviously, you don't stop at velocity. You ask, what is the momentum of the particle? Right? And that's what Einstein asks next. So you get a four momentum. And that's where all the interesting stuff starts happening, mass times velocity mass times velocity will give you mc over 1 minus v squared over c squared. Uh, this is basically the velocity in the rest frame, I mean, or rather, you know, that you measure. So uh, I, I think you'll, you'll probably agree with me if I write it, mv over so that's your momentum. Four momentum. Four momentum. And so this is clearly a very weird object. And you know, when Einstein started looking at it, it's, what did I just get? Because I, I know all my classical ideas of momentum and velocity. What's this thing? What's going on here? And, and, and that's when he starts looking at it a little more carefully. And what you observe is something really dramatic now, is that uh, if you look at the second term, Anyway, I'm, I think I've written those things down. So the second term here, uh, is you know mv over that whole thing. Right? Somehow it's related to the classical notion of uh, momentum. And uh, if you take this and you say, well, what if my velocities were very small, right? Then v over c can be much smaller than one, right? First of all. Uh, what is it if my velocity is zero? Right. And this thing is zero. There's no momentum. That's fine. What is it if my velocity is very small with respect to c? Then you kind of do a Taylor series on the right uh, of this, and you get one minus half, you know, m v squared over c squared, and you know some other terms. Right. And uh, what Einstein reasons here is well, uh, it looks like I have you know, uh, not, you know, my classical notion of momentum, but then I also have these other terms which uh, I had missed because I had not taken into account, you know, these relativistic phenomena. These are, you can do the numbers for a classical particle, it's very small compared to that one. 
is v is much smaller than c, and this turns out to be very, very small compared to those things. So he says that, well, at least it makes a nice connection to my classical notion of momentum because that's my classical momentum, and here are the things that were always there, but we could not measure for slowly moving particles. That, that, that was that. That's the justification for it. But the big surprise is the first term. Right? So what's going on with the first term? What is this object now? So, so the first term looks like mc over 1 minus v square over c square. Now you see in a very strange, strangely, here, if you put v is equal to 0, this thing doesn't go away. If, if, if the velocity is 0, this thing is still m times c. This is something very strange. So he says, well, well, no matter. Let's first just expand it again and see what happens. So we get 1 minus half v squared over c squared plus some other terms, right? Some other terms here. And, and, and then you uh, m times c and, uh, sorry, minus, it should be plus, right? When you take minus up to the top, you get a plus and all that. Right? So it's a plus sign. And you get a mc plus and half. So what do you get? mv squared over 2c, right? Is that correct? So mc, okay, mc over v squared over c squared. So yeah, that's what you get, right? Square. And then there are some other terms. Yeah. Yeah. And and here, uh, uh, what you what, what he notices is if he takes this, let's call this just p naught. You know, these are typically for four vectors. You you refer to this as you know v naught, v one, v two, and v three. This is just zero, one, two, three notation. Okay. So this is p naught, just that. So you know, p naught looks like that. So you can multiply it by c everywhere. And what you notice that if you do that, what you get in the second term is something you can immediately identify. What oh, sorry, half. You get half mv squared. Okay. And that's the classical notion of kinetic energy. The kinetic energy, the energy due to motion of a particle, half mv squared. So that's very weird because you get got it out of just looking at momentum. The form momentum gives you the kinetic energy. And what Einstein now says is, well, this must be then some form of a total energy of a particle. This is the total energy of a particle. If it's moving, it has an energy, it costs you this much energy. But even if it is not moving, this is the energy the particle has. Even if it is not moving, this is the rest energy of a particle. And, and this is uh, the total energy of the particle now. Basically, you know, c times p naught is mc squared. So that's the total energy of the particle. That's that's it. And this is, I think, you identify is, is basically the responsible for all, you know, the mc squared is responsible for all, you know, nuclear energy and mass mass conversion to light energy and all that stuff. This is what's responsible. Okay, so so you can see now uh, you can write the four momentum. In a nice way, you can write it as the total energy over C, E over C, is P naught, that's the first term of the four momentum, comma, the kind of more classical version of momentum, which is, you know, uh, related to the velocity, you know, m dx dt and all that stuff. You can write it in the, this way. And now, uh, so, so that's, that's your uh, four momentum. And uh, now if you go back to Minkowski and say that, well, clearly what Minkowski is saying that no matter what vectors you manufacture out of this four thing, this thing will always be conserved if you take my norm. If I take the Minkowski norm, it's always going to be conserved, no matter what reference frame you are in. If I take the Minkowski norm of this now, p dot p, right? what's the prescription? It's this square minus that square, minus. So what I'll get is E over C whole squared minus C squared will always be conserved. And you can check it. You can take these values, right? You take that square minus that square. Okay. 
and that's going to say what you will get is the mass times speed of light squared. Okay. Speed of light is same in all reference frames. And mass doesn't change; it's the same. So this is always the same, right? Does that make sense? I mean, that's that's what essentially uh, the Minkowski norm. Mathematically, it is guaranteed you will be constant, and you do get it constant. What is that constant? It's that right? m c squared. Therefore, from here, what you get is e squared is equal to you know, m c squared whole square whole square. Okay? That's the total energy of any particle. Right, and I think you may, may have seen this, but uh, uh, this is kind of the, one of the major results of uh, relativity, special relativity, special theory of relativity, that uh, the energy, net energy squared is mass, you know, mc squared, that's the rest part, and then there's a kinematic momentum part. If you have a photon, on the other hand, I think you realize that for a photon, there is no mass, right? For a photon, that's actually a special object. For a photon, you will get E is equal to P times C from here directly. There's no mass right, for photon. So you get E is equal to P times C. OK, so, uh, okay. All right, good. so, uh, so all, all that is good. So now the question is, what does this have to do with spin at all? Right? I mean, that's, that's what we started out with. So that's the major result of special relativity. And that's where you look at it, and you suddenly realize that there's a big problem with Schrodinger equation now. Because uh, you look at the energy of any particle. What did my Schrodinger equation first tell me? So let's look at that. Right? And that, that, that's where we get into Dirac's modification of Schrodinger equation and the way he uni unifies these you know, special relativity with quantum. And that's where you know, the spin and all that stuff is born. Okay. So uh, Schrodinger equation uh, looks uh, IH bar. You know, d d over dt of psi is equal to. Let's look at uh, you know uh, p square by two m times psi. You know, just a free particle, free free electron, free particle. That's how your Schrodinger equation looks, right? It's kinetic energy and no potential. Let's say. Zero. <coughs> so this this essentially in a momentum uh, reference frame, you'll get e psi is equal to p squared by 2m psi in the momentum. If you are in a momentum eigenstate, for example, this is what you're going to get, right? Energy is equal to p squared by 2m. And this is telling you that's not right. There's some more terms here, which have to do with speed of light and other things. You need to change that. Does that make sense? I mean, it, 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 clearly, there's no speed of light in the Schrodinger equation. So it's not consistent with special relativity. So this was a first attempted to make it uh, unify it in you know, quantum mechanics with special relativity. Uh, quite a few attempts. One of the nice attempts is you see what what we have here is e square is right. That's what we have, right? And uh, I think we have seen some procedures for how to deal with it. Energy is minus i h bar d by d t, right? energy operator wise that's how it looks so you can write it you can try you know it in this way energy square is equal to momentum is minus i h bar gradient right you know, try that squared c squared plus you know these things there's no, no operator here so you can try that and then see see what you get meaning can can i actually write this psi is equal to this psi and reformulate my schrodinger equation does that make sense? I mean, essentially, I'm, I'm just trying to write, uh, you know, uh, reformulate Schrodinger equation, but now I'm taking into account the new relation for energy from special relativity. This is the full relation. So, so I try to modify that. And when you do that, and you kind of rearrange that a little bit, what you will get here is a del squared minus 1 over c squared of wave function will be mc over h bar all square times wave function. This is what you're going to get if you modify it in that way. You see, this operator looks just like the Maxwell, you know, operator, right? uh, wave wave operator, and uh, looks like a perfectly reasonable equation. But what happens with this is, this is uh, first of all, this is uh, uh, also pretty famous, called the Klein-Gordon equation. Uh, 
uh, it was the first attempt to identify special relativity and quantum mechanics. And it uh, uh, has a special use in uh, particles that have no spin, typically. I mean, uh, by mesons, I forget. I mean, some particles that have no spin. And it's used typically in quantum field theory and other things. But uh, unfortunately, it doesn't represent electrons. It, it cannot represent electrons. And the reason for that is uh, if you, from here, try to find what is my current density, or the probability density, or current density, uh, actually, you can find out what is the probability density of particles. You will see that it is, uh, 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 it can even become negative. The probability density, which is psi star psi. You know, that can become negative. So it can lead to negative probabilities for particles that have spin, and which is why it, it was, it is not the correct description of particles that have spin. In fact, Schrodinger himself had found this first, and then he rejected it because of this problem, and he ended up with his equation. So, uh, uh, and, and I think from here, you can also identify this quantity here that's sitting inside the square. That thing uh, must be uh, 1 over some length square, right? Because this is 1 over length d by dx, right? And that length, lambda over 2 pi, is uh, uh, 1 over lambda. It's just a h bar over mc. So this lambda is called the Compton length, a very characteristic length. So a lambda will be, yeah, just take 2 pi over there and you get Planck's constant by mass of particle divided speed, uh, speed of light. That's the Compton length. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let me uh, try to uh, maybe wrap up here. So, so, so the question now is, uh, uh, if this is not, the Klein-Gordon equation is not satisfying the equation for electrons, what is it? And, and this is what Dirac found. Uh, he, he, he saw this equation. He says, that clearly, I, I, I need to operate with energy, not with energy squared. This is energy squared, right? E squared. He said, no, I need to find an expression for energy. Energy is square root of that. And you are in a very unfortunate situation of trying to take a square root of an operator. It's a problem. Square root of a differential operator like d by dx, right? It's a problem. But uh, in looking at it carefully, Dirac discovers that he can actually do it. And then it's just that you don't have to think of it that way. Uh, what he says is, uh, uh, I, I'll just outline it in the last few minutes and leave it here. You can look at it, follow up from here in the next class on Wednesday. So he says that uh, I want to write, uh, you know, E psi is equal to uh, I h bar, you know, d by dt. I don't want to write e square is equal to the square. I want to take the square root. So, and this aspect of square root is very interesting now. So what he, what he, what he says is, uh, what, what do I have to do? I have to find and uh, you know, find an equation that looks like this. Uh, that, uh, uh, so I have del squared minus 1 over c squared d2 by dt squared. Right? That's what I have on this side. I have to find some coefficients that I d over c del by del t four squared. Find those a coefficients a, b, c, and d because d z d by d z is del. I mean, basically, this thing expands out to del x squared plus del y squared plus del z squared, right? And that's d by d t squared. So he writes at a times this plus b times this c plus i d over c. C is the speed of light. So you take square of it, you get minus 1 over c squared d squared del t. So he says, if I can write it like this, then my equation will be del x plus b del y plus c del z del t acting on the wave function of the electron e psi is equal to, uh, actually, okay, so, so this, this will lead to uh, zero, right? This is going to be my equation, new equation, modified from here. Now the question is what are these A, B, C, and D? That, that's what he was trying to find. And he looks at it very carefully and that was actually one of those times when he had realized that many things that in classical mechanics were numbers, in quantum mechanics became matrices. 
And then if you expand this out, what you see is in order for this equation to hold, you have to term by term satisfy all these things. What you'll get is a square is equal to b square is equal to c square is equal to one. That's what you're gonna get. You can see that from here. You know, a square will be del by del x squared, and there's del by del x squared here, the coefficient is one. Yeah. So one. Now, if you look at the cross terms, a b plus b a, they will all be equal to zero. So they anti-commute, this thing, a b equal to b a. AB will be equal to minus BA and all that, right? in order to just satisfy this. Right? And uh, uh, so, so this is true, uh, sorry, is equal to D squared too, is equal to one. And then you have this set of you know, many equations, AB plus BA and same thing, you know, BC plus CB is equal to zero and all that stuff. And what you realize is, uh, again, A, B, C, and D cannot be real numbers, cannot be numbers, not even complex numbers. They have to be mat matrices. That's what he realizes. And not, the, not only that, what he realizes is these matrices, you solve for it, A, B, C, and D, are uh, not just two by two matrices, which Pauli had introduced as the Pauli spin matrices. These are four by four, minimum four by four matrices. And that's what he finds. Okay? So each of these, A, B, C, and D, is a four by four matrix. So that means, uh, so here's, here, here are the four matrices. Very interesting. So D looks like there's an identity matrix, there's a negative identity matrix, zero, zero. You take a square of this, you will get the identity matrix with the ones in the denominator. So in some sense, each of these, just like square root of I is equal to, you know, uh, or rather square root of minus one is equal to I, or square root of one is plus minus one, right? Right? Just like that, this is the square root of you know, let's say one, zero, zero, one. What's the square root of identity matrix? It's extension of that now. These are the matrix. You take square of them, you'll always get identity matrix. But now what appears here for A, B, and C are the Pauli spin matrices. Okay. And here immediately says that the wave function is not just, I think I, I wrote zero, so this would be MC by H bar. Sorry about that. MC over. So what he's saying is basically all these quantities are four by four terms and the wave function has four components. Four components in order to be satisfied relativity. And it just so turns out that's essentially, that's where the spin is born immediately. I mean, these are the spin matrices and we'll see that in the next class. I think I'm out of time now. But uh, in order to be able to merge the special relativity which has, which came from light and motion of planets and all that stuff to that of electrons moving in solids and all that, you see it's very beautifully what emerges is these particles must have spin, right? and, 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 and it's a consequence of relativity. It's very, very nice. So now the question is, uh, how, how do we then take it from here, and what are these consequences on transport and such things? So we'll talk about that in the next class and so okay? Okay, good. So uh, I will, I'm trying to write up the notes on this. Uh, I think there are obviously some nice lectures on relativity get going into more details, but I tried to distill the major points here. Okay? And uh, uh, really, this is the major point, and then, from here, Dirac finds that you need to modify it in a particular way, and what is born is spin. Okay, and uh, what we'll see is when we talk about all this topological stuff and all that, this sort of a metric, the Minkowski metric and all. Yeah. So Einstein goes on after this and uses this idea to develop general relativity, which explains the origin of gravitation. And what is interesting is all this idea on topological insulators has some connection to that. You know, basically when this this thing here, you know, one minus this Minkowski metric, when it starts changing slightly, the reason it changes in general relativity is because of gravitation. Gravitation bends this metric you know, and changes it. Similarly, for condensed matter systems, we'll see that uh, just like it does it for here, for solid state and condensed matter systems, you will also see the anal analogous features, and that's what we're going to discuss a little later. Okay, good. Yeah, uh, and uh, I'll send out an email about where to meet tomorrow, uh, which room okay, at, at 5:30. Okay, thanks. <coughs> Thank you.